Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors, endless stories. Friends in Fiction is a podcast with five best-selling novelists whose common love of reading, writing, and independent bookstores bound them together with chats, author interviews, and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Best-selling novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. At the start of the pandemic, they got together for a virtual happy hour to talk about their books, their favorite bookstores, writing, reading, and publishing in this new uncharted territory. They're still talking, and they've added fascinating discussions with other best-selling novelists. So join them live on their Friends and Fiction Facebook group page every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, or listen and view later at your leisure. Hello, everyone. Here we are with our brand new inaugural Behind the Book bonus episodes. We'll be doing these, I know we're so excited. We'll be doing these about once a month. And tonight we are kicking it off with the fabulous, amazing Rachel McMillan. But we are still friends in fiction. I am Patty Callahan Henry, and I'm your host this evening. And my latest novel is Becoming Mrs. Lewis. I'm Mary Kay Andrews, and my latest book is Hello Summer. Hi, I'm Mary Alice Monroe, and my latest novel is On Ocean Boulevard. I'm Kristen Harmel, and my latest novel is The Book of Lost Names. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey, and my latest book is Feels Like Falling. Five best-selling authors, endless stories. We are so thrilled about our new bonus episodes where we meet new authors and focus on the art and craft of writing. As you can see, there are more than five of us, and we want you to re meet Rachel McMillan, a tongue twister. Her latest book is London Restoration and just came out last week. And we are still supporting our bookstore of the week, which is Page and Palette in Fairhope, Alabama. And if you click the link in our Friends in Fiction Facebook page, you'll find a link to all of our books, including Rachel's newest, for 10% off. Rachel and I met on a street in New Orleans, mm -hmm. which oh. sounds way oh. sexier than it was. It because was so it was hot. New Orleans. <laughs> which <laughs> God bless so them tonight. Hot. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. bless them tonight. But it wasn't a fun New Orleans party. It was, it was a dorky library convention. And it was at least 69,354 degrees out on the street. <laughs> <laughs> but we bonded immediately, not only because we were sharing a publisher and loved books, but we, because we are both madly in love with the same man. Right. Endeavor, from the PBS show Endeavor. Sean Evans, my boyfriend. No, no, no. I called Jeff. He's my Gordon in my novel. So no. Sean <laughs> Evans. Picture everywhere. Love it. Uh, we when we're in a bad mood, we text each other photos of Sean Evans. Oh the my! Moment, keeps it going. <laughs> It'll always put you in a better mood. But the more, the more I came to know Rachel, the more I admire her. Not only is she one of the most prolific writers I know, but she is one of the most avid readers I know. And she is a literary agent. She is the author of the Herringford and Watts Mysteries, the Van Buren and DeLuca Mysteries, the Three Quarter Time Series, and in her newest London Restoration. She is also the author of a nonfiction book called Dream Plan Go, a travel guide to inspire independent adventure. She is also vaguely obsessed, which is an understatement, with Hallmark movies, and she has written a very merry holiday movie guide. Oh, I, it just came yesterday. Oh, oh no, really? Oh, oh that is so be thick. <laughs> Rachel lives in Toronto, Canada. Since we are focusing on the art and craft of writing, we'll be talking about that, 
But first, Rachel, I want you to tell us about your new book. I heard about it when it was just the inkling of an idea. You and I were both in London. I was there for Becoming Mrs. Lewis and we met for breakfast and you whispered this book idea and I was enchanted. So tell us everything. Now it's a real thing in the world. It's a thing. Um, a gorgeous cover, the London Restaurant. Yep. And uh, it really is amazing for me because it's my departure uh, from the mystery genre and historical mysteries. And I guess I can add a bit of a publishing tip here is prospective writers, you may not get into the publishing door in the genre that you set out to write. Mm -hmm. Often you take an opportunity, you spend the time, if you're me, you put everything, your passion into historical mysteries, which I did for eight books, waiting for the moment where I would have the opportunity to pitch historical romance, which is the genre I've written in my teddy book journals since I was a little kid, or my teddy bear journals. Um, Patty, besides my mom, was the first person to hear that I was in London. <laughs> And again, authors, you know this, I was not contracted at the time. I hadn't, I was waiting to pitch a proposal, but I knew that spending 10 days of research on the Christopher Wren churches in London and at Bletchley Park, where the code breakers and spies were, would inform a proposal that I hoped that my publisher wouldn't say no to. So the London restoration is basically a twofold <laughs> restoration. One is it's set just after World War II and Diana Somerville, an architectural historian, is returning from four years at Bletchley Park having signed the Official Secrets Act and reuniting with her husband Brent, whom she's madly in love with but whom she cannot tell where she's been. And he is returning from a stretcher bearer at the front. And together they're trying to get to know each other while Diana is commissioned by an MI6 agent to use her knowledge of the Christopher Wren churches to zone in on a Soviet agent called Eternity. So you get a deep dive into these beautiful churches, bombed and blitzed, and the way that they established the grading system in London, the way that post-war London evolved in this resiliency of these amazing people, but also the potential to see the beauty of these structures that we see as they were rebuilt nowadays. So it's very atmospheric, steeped in a lot of history, but it's a romance and a married romance. It starts where usually the movie credits would roll with the sepia tones and the music swelling. <laughs> we're catching up with people who need to fall in love again and again and again because they've become strangers to each other. So that's, that's my newest book. Nice. That's amazing. Love, yeah. I love how you not only just told us about the book, but how you finally got to write the book you wanted by persevering through other books. Mm -hmm. I think all of us have been there. All of us have done what it, I, I love that. We have so many questions for you. So yes. I'm the host, I get to go first. So <laughs> You and I have talked a lot about this, about how reading isn't just for the pleasure of reading, which it is, but how it also connects us with others. And you are so active on social media, talking about what you've read and how reading not only is a creative battery power, but also connects us with others, which is part of why we started this show. But I want you to talk to us about that and how that works for you and how it's helped you in your career, since we're talking about you know, the art and craft of this career? Well, first of all, if you're going to pursue publishing, you need to have a genuine sense of reading love mm. because without it, you will not survive. There is no way in the world to make authentic connections in the writing, reading library and bookstore community without a genuine love of reading. Yep. And that means reading widely and it means reading often and it means building in reading into your writing and pursuit of publication. If you think you're reading enough, you're not. If you can read more, read even more than that. But what's more, learn how to love books written by other people so much that if you start to feel that an internal editor is happening or you're feeling competitive, then you stop writing until you learn how to read again with a deep love because reading is what informs our world and our world only works when we love on each other's books 
without expecting mm -hmm. anything in return, just a natural love of reading. Mm -hmm. Once you have that, you're ready to be a part of this community that only works mm -hmm. when we elevate each other. We elevate other authors. We spend time endorsing debut writers. If we're Kristen Harmel, you text Rachel McMillan when she just lost her mind over a book of lost names, you get to that point. But here's a bonus. When you're pursuing publication, when you're at a writer's conference, when you want an agent or an editor, you need to know the market because whatever you're writing is two or three years behind what's being signed. So you need to be attentive enough to see where the trends are going. And that's easy to find if you read widely, you stop at your bookstores, you ask your librarians, and you follow the trends. And that kind of goes back to sometimes you get in the door, you establish yourself in whatever way you can, you use your traditional publishing books, even if they're in historical mystery, to start helping others. And then when you publish the book of your heart, people will write your editor and say, this is the book that I know Rachel has been wanting to read. They went to my editor and asked to endorse it. And that only happens when you're a reader first. So every writer, please, the community only works if we love on each other's books and craft. Oh, I kind of have chill bumps. I do, but a great a answer. Great <laughs> answer. It was really good. Uh, yeah. Mary Kay, I know you want to. Yeah, Rachel, you're an author and an agent. You know, um, the world wants us to think that COVID is a death knell to the publishing business. A reader named Catherine Stilwell says that readers from all over now have an opportunity to meet the authors and hear them speak about their books. Is the book industry booming? Um, she says, I imagine libraries and shops are having difficulty keeping up with the demand. Some of us are going to be in semi-isolation for a long time. So there's, it's kind of a two-part question. One part of the world thinks books are dead. <laughs> and the other part of the world says, we can't get our hands on enough books. Which, which, which is the reality, do you think? Well, I would put it through this lens. About a decade or so ago, the Kindle came out at the time of a recession in Canada, in the US, yeah. all over the world. And I remember, I was working in educational publishing at the time. My entire life has been publishing. I have graduate credits in publishing. So I, I come from that. But I remember people saying the Kindle is, that's it for books. And yet yeah, more and more that. we see people wanting print books. Mm -hmm. But I would also take a moment to remember this, that your perspective of something informs how you engage with it. So Ooh. if you're a prospective author and you've decided that the book industry is dead, you carry that and you pass that on to other people. Or if you're a writer in the writer community, then you're not paying attention to seeing the successful things that are happening. Like this, for example, you got together, you wanted to support indie bookstores. If we have the savvy, we can snatch this moment to be the moment where we redefine how we engage with people who may never have been able to make a book signing in person or never been able to go to a writer's conference because they can't afford the airfare. Let's embrace it and not focus on that. There's always challenges in book publishing and there's always rumbles. But also remember this. Remember how excited I was, I do, to get a haircut after not getting one? <laughs> <laughs> that first moment in a bookstore, that first moment at a library, yeah. that's going to happen for a lot of us a lot sooner then TV shows will be filming yeah. and movies will be filming and theater breaks my heart because I'm a huge theater nerd will be happening on stage. We are at the moment where our fresh content can break any COVID barrier. We can get a book tomorrow on our phone. Yeah. So I would say not to focus on that as for books thriving I just think that you should go to Twitter someday, ignore all the politics and the cat gifts, and <laughs> the media through Publishers Weekly or through Publishers Lunch or on Tuesdays when all the new releases come out and follow people who are sharing their excitement and internalize that. 
you have enough negativity from a global pandemic, a hurricane, murder hornets, an economy, just murder everything hornets. So put your blinders on to the power of books to prevail. And the more we get through this, the more we're going to keep being innovative. So a bit of a ramble, but I hope that touched on some of those points. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Great. I loved it. Amazing. Christy Woodson <laughs> Harvey. Yeah. Well, and it leads into my, I really have like 11 questions for you, <laughs> but it's one, it's one question. One. Um, yeah, but I do think that you really touched on something that, you know, our ability to transition during this time and our ability to kind of keep on our toes really is sort of defining, you know, how we move forward. And it's just, it's going to be a really interesting time. So yeah. as both an author and a literary agent, what do you think is the new normal in publishing? Do you think that people are going to be reading differently? Do you think contracts are going to be different? Like, what do we need to know that you're seeing from the author and the agent side? The 11 questions. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So I would say that we were starting to see a shift even before the pandemic. It's just the mm -hmm. pandemic exacerbated some of the things that were happening. I will say positively that I was able to find contracts for clients over the pandemic. Many people were re-signed. Many people made the New York Times bestseller list. But I would also say that some places were already <laughs> worried about the decline of bricks and mortar stores yeah. or the gigantic Leviathan that is Amazon. That's was something that was different because when Amazon started prioritizing shipping of non books, mm -hmm. people went to book depository. People went to books a million people focused on their indie bookstores. So at the risk of, turning the conversation positive. I want authors to know that the new normal is whatever we make it uh, to thrive. Yeah. Yeah. And what we have this week, shout out to Fiona Davis. Oh, oh, fantastic. Yeah. New York Times, right? This, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Look at the Lions of Fifth Avenue. Look at the book of lost names. Look at the library and book centered books that will be the imprint of authors throughout this pandemic. I think that's a magical kismet. We are readers. We will make it happen. We will survive. We've got all the tools. 20 years ago, we couldn't be having this amazing Zoom call where I'm in another country. Um, so <laughs> I'm sure they won't let us in. <laughs> no. and, you know to be honest not I yet <laughs> we'll get there hey christy um, you gotta see if you can even get in oh it's, no we can't get in for a not while yet. we know that <laughs> no, 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 no. um but i have to tell you question asker uh catherine that you know i was really excited this year because what author doesn't dream of three releases in one year and i waited my whole life for this moment and it turned out to be 2020. <laughs> and one of them is called dream plan and go, not dream plan and stay in your apartment and order. <laughs> dream plan, nothing, just dream and plan. <laughs> so what? And drink. <laughs> and drink. And drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's the book you should have written. <laughs> dream plan and drink. <laughs> and drink. <laughs> uh, so what you have to do is rewire your brain to think of how it can be an opportunity. Yeah. I decided with that book that yes, it published on May 6th when, you know, you couldn't even go to a coffee shop and sit down in Toronto, that books can have a marathon appeal and that as things open up more, people are going to be itching to travel. So how mm -hmm. can I, I think rewire so. that story mm -hmm we tend to think, and I'm hoping this is reflected in the publishing world, where often, and you know this as writers, they often dictate the success of a book within a few weeks, whereas mm. usually it takes a trickle. It takes word of mouth. You know, I caught the end of the episode just before this one where someone was saying that they heard about this through a coffee shop. Mm, well, yeah. Consider how powerful that I is. I love that. Yeah. So you can look at it in two ways. And I decided to try and do whatever I could to engage with people online through books and book love. And mm -hmm. London Restoration so far has been by far my most successful fiction book. 
an enterprise to date. So I'm just going to like grab onto that. Sorry, you got Sunny McSunshine here on your, uh, if you were looking for the dark and dirty world of stand no, no, it's no, refreshing. I think Thank this you. Is, it's this refreshing. This is exactly what we're looking for because I do think so many yeah. people feel so daunted. And sometimes I think as writers, we look for an excuse to feel daunted. I mean, like, can't pitch now. We're in a pandemic. No one's yeah. buying, you know, I mean, we look yeah. for those excuses to like not have to put ourselves out there. So no, this is exactly this is why we wanted you, Rachel, so that you could and tell I, us what we needed to hear. And, and I, I think also for the young authors who are yeah. trying to get published, yeah. this kind of belief that it can happen, I'll just have to, you know, just can do is really yeah. inspiring. Yeah. yeah. And most importantly, look at how this summer has shone a much needed spotlight on own voices and black authors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All of so the true. publishing companies who are taking off their usual unsolicited manuscripts and actually spending the time that we should have spent time on years ago. Right. Try and find a wonderful space for every last bit of inclusivity. If that's the new normal, then hey, good. I'm all for that new normal. Yeah. We're in. Absolutely. That's a good one. Okay, good. Kristen Harmel, what you got? Well, my first question is, um, Rachel, can we be best friends? Because I need some sunny <laughs> McSunshine in my life. I mean, <laughs> seriously, I, I, I love your optimism and I love how supportive you are of other of other writers and of people at sort of all, all places in the journey. So, um, you know, official invitation extended for best friendship, you know, if, if that, if that interests you, but, um, <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I looked at your list of novels and nonfiction and it's overwhelming. You had how many books out last year? Was it four? Oh, it's been a lot. Oh my God. But, la but like last year alone or within the last year, yeah, I, 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 it's it's mind boggling. Um, so, uh, on your social media, also you talk about books as if you read one a day. How in the <laughs> world do you write so much and read so much, and represent clients? I mean, how, like, do you sleep? How, how how do you do it? And do you outline? Do you free write? Like, just kind of take us through the nuts and bolts of what you do. Well, I think that I was very intentional in my pursuit of the publishing business. I always wanted to be published. So what I did, and I don't know if this is everybody's path, is that I spent four years just making connections as a blogger and what I call, I, I call myself a book gusher because I just love gushing about books and reading agent blogs. And I got my agent and my first book was signed in 2016. And at this time I was still working full time for an educational publisher in Canada. Um, and from there I got a look at the industry and I would read on the subway commute and I would write at lunchtime. And I think that, you know, I'm going to say it. Sometimes you sacrifice vacations. Sometimes like me, you're working on London restoration line edits through Christmas and new years. Yeah. I, oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I believe that you have to want it five times more than anyone else and work five times as hard. Yeah. And you have to have, the marathon and Stephen Leacock's a Canadian writer. And he said, I'm a great believer in luck. I find the harder I work, the more I have of it. Yeah. And so uh, I have given up a lot for writing, but it's what I always wanted to do. I will say that I am blessed in that I am a fast reader. It depends. If I'm reading a 1500 page tome on the work of Christopher Wren, it takes a little bit longer and I <laughs> see some of it. But when I lose myself in a story, and that's why I chunk time out for reading. Because when you're in this world, we talk about blurbing and endorsing, just having a name like Patty's or Sue Meissner's on the front or Kristen, having a name just helps elevate you to readers. So it's just so important to keep reading. I do outline, but I also leave myself room for rabbit holes. I also really rely on the fact that I've had some amazing editors. I don't know about you, but often my books come alive in the developmental edit stage. Yeah. The first draft mm -hmm. is terrible. And when you look at it as teamwork, 
and that you just have to get it out there and you have chance to refine it and to go over it, that's really helped. So a lot of it has been just a lot of hard work. There's been kismet moments and connections, which have been wonderful, but it's just a lot of hard work and a lot of time. And I think all of you would say that. There will be moments where someone is lifted, you know, the, the, in the 1930s Hollywood movie, a star is born and someone's on Broadway in an understudy role and then suddenly they're the biggest star in the world. There, there are moments where that happens, but for a lot of us, it's just years and years of work. Yeah. So that's, it's been a bit of roundabout, but I, I hope that answers that a little bit. Absolutely, well, great answer. Well, and I think the thing is, Rachel, that a lot of people, including us sometimes, think that there's a secret we don't know. Right? <laughs> like there's, there's a secret everybody else knows. I know. Don't know and, How to cross the line, yeah. Yeah, and I think the secret is that there is no secret. And yeah. Other than hard work, I think you nailed yeah. it. Yeah. Hard work. Yeah. I remember when we were in college, the, the dean of the first freshman gathering said, everyone look to your right, everyone look to your left, one, one of you or two of you won't be here in four right. years. Yeah. It was so depressing, but it actually it's sort of that way if you're in the race for writing a book too, getting published, you have to work hard and really want it. How much do you want it? And there are so few slots. So you not only have to think just about yourself and your career, but it's like any job interview. It's like any corporate meeting. You have to be a team player. Because if it comes down to a pub board, which is where they make the final decision about a book, and it's between you and one other author, and you both have kind of the same sales, the same scope, are they going to go with the one who goes above and beyond and supports other people and keeps an eye on the industry? Or are they going to go with the one that, oh, maybe if we give them a pretty cover, they'll skyrocket? <laughs> Publishers at the end of the day are not just this magical unicorn we pursue, they are people and they want good people on a team. And so I think that that goes so hand in hand. It's the hard work, but it's also being approachable and wonderful and someone that people want to have around. Oh, I love that. Okay, Mary Alice, I know you have a question. One's from the- um, Yeah, this is a reader question. Yeah. And, and this is from Anne E. Young and she wants to know, um, can you offer advice to new authors regarding self-publishing versus trying to find an agent or an established publisher? So I think that, you know, a lot of us are asked that question, but I think you have your foot in both camps. Yeah, I've done so both. I'm really, yeah, so I'm really, I've actually self-published a couple books too. So I'm really interested in your answer on this one. Well, I would say first of all that the stigma around self-publishing that pervaded the industry for a very long time is gone. And also that if you have any kind of ego about, oh, but it's not traditionally published, remember most of your readers browsing Amazon with a good cover and description are not gonna know the publisher name. That's something we know. We know imprints, they're not gonna know. So mm. remember that it's accessible, but also remember that you can want different things and that's legitimate. If you just really want to get your story in front of people on your own timeline without the business aspect, without an editor saying, please do this, or this isn't the, isn't the book that's going to get you in the door, self-publishing is a great idea. I self-publish novellas, contemporary romances set in Vienna, because I know that I couldn't pitch those to a traditional publisher at this point and have them take them. And it reminds me of the joy I used to have writing stories in my notebook with no one else around. And I want to keep that joy. So I publish them and it's almost like, if you want to look over my shoulder, that's fine. But I would also provide a bit of caution here. And that's where if you want to self publish, but also traditionally publish, remember that the moment you self publish, you have a sales track record. And the salespeople at a publishing committee board, which is the final decision, are the ones who are going to say, oh, they have a book out. Let's see the sales. And that can be a little daunting to them, even if it is from an independently published project. So I would keep that in mind. Also know that it's all legitimate. But if you're going to do it, pay the upfront cost for a good editor, a good cover, and know that 
you can get to a point where can I gosh, look at me. I'm so lame opening my, my but my publisher now includes my three quarter time series in my books, which are fantastic because yeah. you can cross over readers. But mm -hmm. what I would say is that they're two different things. If you just want to publish to get your story out fast, that's a legitimate thing. If you want to pound the pavement with no guarantee of publishing, that takes a different type of love of story. Because, you know, as we've talked about so many of us, Mrs. Lewis, for example, I mean, joy is a book of your heart. All the books are books of your heart in one way, but the passion project takes years of research, takes kismet, takes everything aligning. So they're both legitimate. You pocket money once you self publish, because after you pay for your cover and your editor, please do that. You automatically get those royalties. But I would say read traditional author blogs and writing spaces and do the same for self-publishing, but know that there's not the stigma there once was that, oh, it's us versus them. There's a lot of hybrid authors. Absolutely. Good answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I like the word hybrid authors. Yeah. yeah. I have never heard that before, but it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. I like that a lot. I haven't tried it yet, but um, there have been books I've gotten the rights back to, and I've, I've thought about That's it. it. You Throw get the rights back. on and send them out into the world. Okay, just real quick, I, we're running, of course. Another one? Talking. Yeah, one more. Ask me to ask that one next question, Mary Alice, if you will. All right. From Anissa Joy Armstrong. Hi, Anissa. I'm sure this will be another great event. Which job do you find the harder job, being an agent or a writer? They're both really challenging. I've only been doing the agent role for about two years now. Um, I would say that they both require a lot of instinct in different ways. As a writer, as I said, I'm watching trends. And as an agent, that works really well. But as an agent, you also have to be able to decide if you're the right person to sell the book, even if you like the traction, even if you like the person's platform and social media numbers, you like the concept. At the end of the day, can you love it enough that you will fight for it? And that can be hard. That instinct can be hard whether you're writing a book or choosing to represent one. The thing I would say that's hardest about being an agent is having to deliver bad news, having to be the front line for conflict because you have to be the liaison mm -hmm. and having to tell a writer that they've been passed on or rejected. Mm -hmm. And I guess because I am a writer, I know what it's like from that side. I do find that I'm learning more about the legal aspect. I work for a great guy named Bill Jensen who's been doing this for 40 years. So he teaches me a lot. Right now, I would say that they're both equally hard because I just, <laughs> the time balance, just in life, sometimes everything comes at once. Um, and I'm having a few weeks where that's happening. All hard. <laughs> joys, are, joys are amazing. Like delivering amazing news to a client or saying, great two publishers want your book that's and the brainstorm oh they're both awesome but uh i would say that writing because it's my passion that's the one that i i find more challenging sometimes because it requires me to be more vulnerable right you have mm, to yeah i get that i get that so, okay, thank you okay, Rachel. now on to what everyone is waiting for including me give us a rachel mcmillan writing tip all right well, you've seen the motif of <laughs> how I speak about the publishing industry. So I'm going to give you a writing tip that I hope translates into your life. And that is a quote. Allow me to quote myself. When does that ever happen? From my <laughs> Con and Go book. That the greatest skill you can learn in life is how to be happy for other people. And the single greatest thing you can do as a writer is realize that success for one of us means success for all of us. When a book like The Nightingale becomes so popular, it elevates the world so that other people, Book of Lost Names, Room on the Rue Amelie, can find their reader. When Lisa Wingate, who spent many years pounding the pavement, if that was not an overnight success story, before we were yours, that means that Sold on a Monday finds readers it might not have found before. Success for someone is success for all of us. 
And then there's no room to be like, oh, I'm not a good enough writer or their publication is going to surpass mine or why aren't my sales like theirs? The more doors we can open through people who pave the way, because none of us are a pioneer. It's all been done before. Northrop Fry used to say that there's only like two original stories, the Bible and King Lear. I don't agree with him, but he's kind of onto something. Um, yeah. how, the Bible and King Lear. How can we make it the best in our voice? And so the greatest skill is to learn how to be happy for other people. And if it's genuine, that means you can go anywhere and meet lots of amazing people and read lots of amazing books. So that's what my heart is as a writer. Oh, I love that. Wow, that's a different direction than we usually hear. I know, I, I know. That that was, a, what a tip. That was great. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to write that. I'm going to listen again. And write I think it. I wanted you to be my BFF too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, get Mary Ellis, oh, get in line. Get in line. <laughs> oh, wait, no, I forgot, what, I forgot what she just said. I, I'm, I'm happy for you. We can both be best friends with her. <laughs> Sorry, you guys, I was first. Okay. <laughs> with your prolific reading, I know you have a load of book suggestions. So I'm going to flip it and ask you to tell us, but. Um, only one. Only one. I know. Please follow me on social media. You get like 13 a day. <laughs> I actually spent time on this because I wanted it to touch on everything that I think is wonderful about all of you and friends and fiction. And I chose Natalie Jenner's The Jane Austen Society. Oh, came cool. out a debut during a time when the world was shutting down. I was supposed to go at the, to the launch because Natalie is a Canadian, just like me who went to research in England, just like me, and spent time at Shotton House unraveling this post-war society of people who love books. Mm -hmm. It made me revisit the source material of Jane Austen in a new way. But added bonus for every bookstore watching, Natalie comes from a background as an indie bookseller. So follow Ooh. her on Instagram and Twitter. This book is huge. And for all of you ladies who like some Richard Armitage, he recorded the audiobook, so you just get to listen to his beautiful voice. The <laughs> Daniel Society, post-war Canadian author who loves books and booksellers and supports indie book so stores because that's her heart. That's my heart too. So read it. Wow, you like hit yeah. on everything we represent. <laughs> that's oh, that's awesome. That was a good one. That's a five stars. And Thank for you. all of you listeners out there, um, Rachel will definitely stop by the page. She's yes. a And she will try to answer some of the questions we didn't get to. And she will tap in and, and join you on the Facebook page. And Rachel, I'm so excited for London Restoration and for you. And I'm so happy you came to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thank fan you. growing out. This is surreal. I appreciate all of you. And um, thank you for what you're doing for books and authors. All of you support authors in the way that I just dream to keep being able to do. So thank you so much for having me. You're it's amazing. a wonderful book, The London Restoration. Really looking forward to it. You're awesome. It. Lots thank of you. success. So that is a wrap from our very first Behind the Book bonus episode. You Yay! can find Rachel's new book at 10% off at our Bookstore of the Week page and palette on our Facebook page. And that's it for Sunday. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.